Welcome to We Talk, an online talk show that is packed with different views and ideas on issues trending across China. I'm Zhong Chuying in Beijing. Today marks China's National Youth Day. There are about 400 million people under the age of 30 in China, and that is equal to the entire workforce in the United States and Western Europe combined. Undoubtedly, to understand the country in the 21st century, you need to understand the young Chinese. What are some of the core values that they are embracing? How are they adapting to this rapidly changing world? And what about some of the stereotypes that they would like to birth? Well, it's my great pleasure to have three smart young ladies joining me here today, millennials and Gen Zers. So tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Leona Liu. I'm 18 years old. I'm from Beijing, China. I currently study in a boarding school in the U.S. called Pomfret, and I'm a graduating senior this year. What about you? Hi, I'm uh, Story Chen, and I graduated from New York University. I'm an independent film director and writer based in Beijing right now. Welcome, Jane. And then? Hi, my name is Chen Jiehao. I'm currently based in Beijing, and I work for a British newspaper. Okay, so good to have you with us. Um, to help our audience better understand um, the two generations, I collected some of the judgments and assumptions from foreign media uh, and netizens about our lifestyle, uh, you know, work value and even consumption habits. So what we're going to do today is to address them one by one, okay? So uh, first of all, assumption number one, Chinese students are test-taking machines and are all good at maths. Well, it's a stereotype that has long been attached to Chinese people. What do you think? Let's start with the only student here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, I think compared to the students in my American school, yes. Chinese students are better at test and math However, that's not to generalize all the students. I think the reason is because of the different educational systems. Um, and when I was in the middle school called Tsinghua University, it's an affiliated middle school, we care more about academic performance. We were very eager to learn knowledge from different subjects. And I think I learned my problem solving skills from here. When I went to the US, it's more about kind of athletic performance and creative thinking. So I think it's like different dynamics, but all beneficial to students. Um, also, I watched currently like the TV show called Little Dilemma, mm -hmm. and it exposed a lot of emphasis on children's mental health and you know their hobbies, things other than grades. So I think the Chinese students are not only good at you know scores, but also they have their own interests as well. What, what about you? What do you think? I think when people say Chinese are good at math, they're hinting at we are lack of um, like creativity and yeah. innovation. But I think that's not a true statement. Uh, I think good at math or you know that kind of logical thinking is our advantage. That's kind of hardware into our educational system, but we can use that into our advantage, and that's not uh, harming us from being an innovative uh, person or getting some creative work done. I think that, you know, it's like one of my Jewish friends here in Beijing, he always takes issue when Chinese friends tell him, oh, Jewish people are really good with, with money. <laughs> I was like, no, I, I take offense with that. And then people will be like, but that's a good thing. Why are you taking offense to that? And it's like, I think his rhetoric was kind of along mine of like Chinese being really good at test making machines is we need to allow for people to be bad at tests and bad at maths <laughs> if, you know, if, if that's not their industry if that's not what they're into and you know we have a lot of people in China so there's gonna be people who are better at tests and better at maths than those who aren't me personally not great at taking tests I don't want to be you know canceled out as a Chinese person just because <laughs> I'm not as studious so I think part of that is allowing for diversity to happen yes exactly but for me I think I, I've studied abroad and um, I think for me it's really more than an impression I think our um, Chinese students or my classmates they are really better at some tough subjects than um, other students from other countries but I think it's not because we are born to be good at uh, those tough subjects, but it's a culture thing um, because the Confucians culture that you know shared by many East Asian countries, we value hard work um, above e everything else. Uh, for example, if a teacher said to a parent that your child is not good at math, if it's a f Western parent, he will probably think that oh my kid, it's 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 fine. He's not good at math, but he might be good at art or sport. But if you say the same thing to a Chinese parent, he might say oh. He's not hardworking. He's lazy. 
So that's completely different two mindsets. We th we think that hard work is the most important, whereas um, the Western parents they attribute the success and failure of a student to the innate ability. So I think that's also um, different. We value hard work so much. And the reality is if you really put enough efforts into whatever even you are not good at, you can make it finally. Yes. How are you as a parent? <laughs> uh, like if your kid is bad at math, so you're like, I'm not you just a need tiger to work mom. harder. Uh, no? I'm not a tiger <laughs> mom. But yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think the awareness of competition is instilled like deep in, in my mind. So. <laughs> Um, honestly speaking, I really expect expect my kid to be good at math, be good at taking tests. Right. Uh, but yeah, but I, I we'll let's see. see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the next assumption, which is assumption number one, is the opposite of number one. Uh, number two is the opposite of number one. If your head isn't buried in books, then young Chinese are slackers. Do you agree with that? Not at all. I think um, we're very hardworking and very realistic because nowadays there's more and more competition, like you said, and everyone has more opportunity to kind of have an education. So the standards have been risen and it's harder to find a job or place that suit us. And I've known friends that graduated but cannot find a job for like three years. So we're more aware of the competition and that's why we work harder to get what we want, what we're interested. We have more resources. Okay, uh, let me give you some background information. Uh, the, one of the examples cited uh, when raising that assumption is that Chinese millennials rebellion against 996 work mode, mm -hmm. uh, which means to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. Do you think it's enough to say that Chinese younger generations are getting lazier? We want to be lazier, but we can't. Yes, like you said, yeah. like it's embedded in us, the competition. There are times when I get asked by friends of mine who were not born in China. Uh, they may be like American Chinese, or but then they don't quite understand why it's built into the system, this, this level of competition. And the example I give them is when I was doing military training in university, which I don't know if you guys did, but I went to a Chinese school. I had to line up to brush my teeth in the morning. It's just everywhere I go, even if it's traveling or taking the subway, I'm well aware of opportunities out there and resources, but also the amount of people who are competing for the same things with me. Um, and I just think that that sort of day-to-day -day exposure um, really shapes the way we think. Um, well, I think it's not about like we are getting lazier, but more about we are more aware of what kind of life that we are aiming for. For example, people are aware that they should have their own leisure time, they should have their time to do something that they like, so they're not agreeing to the system like you have to get off work after 9 p.m. or something. They're just more aware of their rights for, to some extent, I would say. Yeah, they are more conscious compared to the older generations. I think we are more conscious about, mm -hmm. uh, we're conscious of the equal rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Quality and, of life. Yeah, and fortunately, we're entitled to advocate for a better working environment, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good thing, I think. And also, like you just said, I, w many of us might would love to slack off, but we just mm -hmm. can't afford to, to be a lazy person because we are so aware of the competition. Like I just said, mm -hmm. yes. So, it, it slacking off really makes us insecure, right? Mm -hmm. So. Well, I think I don't completely disagree with assumption number two. <laughs> and uh, assumption number three is about our consumption habits. Younger Chinese tend to spend rather than save. This is a tricky one. So I think my parents save more money on buying vegetables that if egg price went from 2.5 to 3, they'd be like, oh, I can't take it. This is, this is impossible. But then they'd spend money on like a really expensive watch, which I would never do because you know, I, I spend more money on eggs and groceries and things because I don't want to go out of my way to argue down prices. But you know, when I wear something, it's just because I like it. I don't really care if it comes with value or uh, a brand or anything. And so most of the things that I buy, clothing-wise, <coughs> way cheaper than them. But then my 
something like day-to-day -day spending is more expensive. So I think it's a little mixed. I think it comes to how you value a person's quality of life. And it really is like a topic that we have to think from person to person. Uh, I might get some really expensive clothes or something that I really like, but on the other wise, I save all of my money. I don't know. But there are also my friends who do that and things like that. I think it's the they make, and that comes to how they spend their lives. Yeah, more, but I think it's very easy to fall to prey of custom patterns because of the food deliveries, online shopping is just so convenient. But on the other hand, something like thrifting has become more popular in China. And apps like Xian Yu, which sells stuff secondhand, is really popular among my friends and I. We both sell and buy clothes from it. So we're more kind of sensitive to the prices. But how do you think um, did we get that reputation? Like um, spending, spending more than, than saving? I think China is the biggest market for luxurious goods. Yes. Uh, so far, it's like what since 2020 or even earlier. And I think w my non-Chinese friends, <laughs> what what they have difficulty understanding is how, say, if you go to Harbin and you meet a nurse who works in a public hospital who makes what three thousand kwai, she would still save up to buy a Chanel bag just because she feels like, you know, that means a lot more to her. And um, I think for a lot of people outside of China, they don't understand how you would save up to buy something way out of your um, sort of price range. It's different values, I think. Yes, and also I think um, it's, uh, it also depends on which city you're from, which city you live in. For the smaller cities where the life cost is relatively low, I think people have little hesitation about spending their money, mm -hmm. right? And one thing I just thought is, <clears throat> I believe more and more uh, young Chinese people, they tend to spend money to get happiness or pleasure. They don't care that much about how much money I have in my bank, but rather than how much pleasure this money can give to me right now. So I guess that's one of the ways of how they value their, they don't care how much money they have in the bank in general, but they rather spend that to give the, you know, the pleasure or what they care right now at this moment. What do you look for when, when you spend your money? Not on your a house. <laughs> <laughs> also because you can't afford one in Beijing. <laughs> um, I think s some of the consumption habits that I've garnered living in a country with Taobao and various shopping platforms and China being the world factory is sort of short-term pleasure. Mm -hmm. Like buying earrings and, and things that will bring me immediate happiness. Um, for example? For example, um, I've learned through years of going on Taobao uh, that Shandong is world-renowned for making different types of earrings uh, for various brands, both domestic and foreign. And so I, you know, whenever I feel like, oh, it's been a really down day, I just need to spend money on something. It's the same way I go to stationery stores when I was a kid. And if I have 10 kwai, I can still buy a bunch of stuff and feel happy. The way I do that now as an adult is earrings from Shandong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, interesting. And what about you? What, what would you like to buy? I love to buy like skirts or just like clothing. I, I, I think it's something called like retail therapy where you know, my friends and I, after a final or a test, we're kind of rewarding ourselves through you know, buying certain outfits to kind of make us feel better. And what? do you expect yourself to buy like five years later or, or ten years later <laughs> i hope more like sustaining pieces not just like fast fashion in a way mm. yeah all right and what about you um i really actually i really tend to spend money i'm that kind of person who really like cares about how much money i have in my bank okay. <laughs> so i'm kind of different from many of my friends um so i tend to spend money um, one thing I'm thinking is that, uh, for example, like she said, earrings, like we, we can spend very little money, but to get great amount of pleasure. So I think that's something that I would love to do too. But I can't think of a certain object that I always, you know, go to when I'm down or anything. Food? But Chocolate? Lipstick? No, I, <laughs> lipstick economy. <laughs> really? Lipstick economy. Yeah, it varies. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I think 
this is true that we um, also the pandemic also must mm -hmm. have changed our consuming habits as well because mm -hmm. for me I think that after being locked down for like entire month mm -hmm. I come to realize that well life could be fulfilling and fun um, even w without splurging <laughs> <laughs> I think pandemic also changed our mind mm -hmm. what about you or, I don't know. I think it's brought out different sides to different yeah. people. I do think it makes people question their current lifestyle or pre-COVID lifestyle more. For me, um, I've sort of stopped buying a lot more material goods and turned more to experiences and foods, mm -hmm. things that really just evaporate after those two hours you have them. But it's more about enjoying the time you have now. Yeah. Um, and you know, being in China, I've been able to travel to a lot of places in the last year or two. Mm. Um, so I've been pretty grateful to have to do that. Um, and from your observation, like abroad, how does the pandemic change people's consuming habits? I think they focus more on kind of communication between each other. So like um, buying stuff for their friends or, you know, using that way to connect with each other, following like fashion trends, especially something on like TikTok is very popular in the U.S. So. A lot of promotion has been going on on there about you know just clothing, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Mm, like I was in New York when the pandemic hit oh, yeah. the world. Yeah. I was there shooting my movie and it got shut off basically. Um, but I was there by myself in my apartment for about two months, and I think what changed the most is my eating habits and my grocery shopping habit. Uh, like I would consider like you know, the difference between different kind of vegetables and how much I can get and how much I can store in my fridge for how long period of time. So that's really detailed calculation that I haven't been thinking of um, before that COVID-19 period. So, yeah. Do you think that you will spend a lot more after the pandemic? Mm. No. Like what, re revenge, what, what is it called? Revenge consumption. Oh, revenge consumption. Yeah. I don't know, mm. I think, I'd like to think people are still more or less rational that they understand if they're spending on something that they didn't feel like they need to, then that happiness will be very short-lived. <laughs> True. And I think especially with the economy that we have post-COVID, a lot of people are gonna be looking for safety nets. Um, which do you, what do you think make you like happier? Spending or saving? Oh, spending for sure. S spending for sure. <laughs> and you? Saving more. Saving really. Yeah. You are more conservative. Yeah, I'm really I can only say spending. <laughs> uh, I, but I think for our old uh, parents' generation, spending makes them more secure, right? You mean saving? Yes, yeah, uh, saving. Yeah, <laughs> saving makes them more secure. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, there is change going on. All right, so let's check out this fourth assumption, which is an offshoot of number three, is that younger Chinese prefer domestic brands. Is that true? I would say it's not exactly a um, preference. It's more like before, maybe a couple of years ago, we are not aware of how good or how um, like efficient our domestic brands could be. But now we are realizing that and we're recognizing that improvement and we are considering both domestic and uh, foreign brands on the same level or same standard. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think Chinese youths go into markets saying, oh, that's from America, I can never buy that. And that's from Australia, maybe I can think about buying that. It's not how our mindset works. I think what's happened is just being the world factory for so many years, the quality of a lot of domestic goods have gone up, especially in terms of like clothing, um, yes. makeup and things, and people are starting to recognize that. It doesn't mean that we you know, get allergic when we see foreign products. It's just that we have more options and better options now. Yes. Yeah. And what do you think? Do you oh. buy domestic brands? Yeah, I love like clothing pieces from domestic brands. I think right now teenagers look up to idols. A lot of idols promote domestic <laughs> brands as well. So it's kind of that, you know, following their step mm -hmm. and, you know, promoting domestic brands as well. Are you one of those young <laughs> people? <laughs> I would say so, yeah. Who is your favorite idol? Um, right now there's someone called Luo Yijou oh. um, in a produce, like idol producer show oh. right now. Yeah, All we right. have no clue. <laughs> yes. Yes. Generation We're starting gap. to show our age. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you will spend money for, for your idol, right? 
I would, yeah. But <laughs> um, logically, I wouldn't be like so radical and extreme buying a ton of stuff. It's still like in restraint. Um, I think another reason for like domestic brands getting more popular um, among our younger generation is that we, you know, we have less admiration for foreign brands uh, because we've grown up um, in an era with so much exposure to Western brands, unlike our parents' generation, right? They, um, they've grown up in an era where with so limited exposure of the outside world. Mm -hmm. So to them, whatever comes from a foreign country, from a foreign country, is luxury, or even a symbol of social status or, or wealth. But for me, it's, for, for our generation, it's completely different, right? Um, I think what we focus more, instead of the brand itself, we focus more on the experience and um, the self-expression, right? We care more about um, if it fits our tastes or if we like the product or not, or the quality of the product. That's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So what about you? Are there any favorite brand, domestic brand that you like? Um, I actually tried a few makeup brands uh, by domestic brands, um, but the thing is, I realized it really impressed me because the quality or the effect when I put them on my face is not that much different from luxury brand or foreign brands, but the price is much, much cheaper. So I think that's how the domestic brands are actually getting more and more consumers to, to buy them because they have really great um, like effect, but also very very good um, price for all the consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the progress that you see in domestic brands? Not only quality, mm -hmm. but also marketing strategy. I think it's gotten well, especially in the clothing industry, it's gotten more creative. Yeah. Like I remember days when you know it's a new year of the monkey or the ox, and then. You know, foreign brands, especially luxurious goods, come up with like pants and coats with just like an animal weaved on it. And you're like, really, this is the best you can do for Chinese customers? And now because of a lot of Chinese companies taking it um, into rings themselves and coming up with original designs, um, I gave a friend a birthday gift for his 30th birthday. And it was a chung sum that is red on the outside. On the inside, it's all mahjong tiles oh. stacked together. And he can kind of just open it up. <laughs> I've told him to wear it to Mahjong Nights. But I think it's one of the ways that uh, companies are doing better in terms of identifying their customers and finding stuff that's more suited for Chinese people. What about live streaming or um, the development of e-commerce? Do you think that also contribute to the success or the development or the popularity of domestic brands? Yeah, for sure. Um, especially now, there are, there's a French friend of mine who says, you know, every month, because he loves food and he loves cooking and everything, he says he'll type in random cities or townships in China and see what type of product that comes after with the keyword search. Like, for example, this is grape season or if it's raisin season or if this place makes really good yeast or bread. Like, he's basically dis discovering all these specialties. And some of them he's found through live streaming from local provincial sort of hosts or sort of celebrities who are promoting these domestic products. So like I said, like I said that um, now domestic brands are growing much more popular among young Chinese. But if going global, what, what else could be done, do you think, to make it more popular, like across the globe, to make it like be liked? by the younger generations in other countries. What else could be done? I think we have a lot of stuff we can play with in terms of cultural elements. I know that there are a lot of sort of high-end clothing brands that look for chung sum or cheap house styles, yes. look for inspiration. So I think that's something we can play off, but going after global markets would be more about finding things that suit them. Yeah. And I think a lot of companies are still kind of figuring that out. Yeah, maybe Easternization is on the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do you expect? I think maybe more campaigns or advertisement with like, um, you know, foreign celebrities because some of them really have a large platform that you know can attract a lot of customers. 
um, you know, how there's foreign brands having maybe Asian ambassadors and it promotes kind of the business as well. So I think it goes both ways. Yeah. And talking about um, buying domestic brands, here comes the next assumption. Because many foreign media or netizens, they think that we're um, getting more patriotic. We're getting more proud of our country. And because or as a result of being brainwashed or we're blindly patriotic. Do you agree with that? I would say definitely no. I would say with um, the information that we younger generation have nowadays, we are very clear of where we are at. And we've seen how much we've gone from maybe three or four decades ago. We see where we were and we see where we are right now. So we have a really comprehensive and objective view of how our country is doing right now. And from my perspective as a film director, um, recent years I've seen movies like um, Dying to Survive, is, which is about you know the Medicare of China. And you've seen um, what's called a Better Days, which is about school violence. Yes. So you're seeing that more and more social issues or social problems are being discussed discussed and being brought to the people and that means that our government or our country is recognizing those problems and are really putting their endeavor into solving these problems including improving our Medicare system or putting more you know money into helping those you know, social issues so I would say I can see the determination of my country to help to keep improving the living condition of, of our uh, people so I would say this is not being brainwashed or being blind, but it's more like we see that our country might have some flaws, but we're also recognizing that we are really being really hard work into improving others, and we recognize our progresses. That's why we're proud of our country. Yeah, I think progress, that's the key of, mm -hmm. to the question. So we um, have witnessed so many accomplishments and achievements, and, and so rapid. Uh, development. You know, we've grown up in an era when China hosted the most marvelous Olympic Games, winning the most gold medals, and uh, sent people to, into space, collected um, Earth from the moon, and even explored the Mars. So yes, we've witnessed so many changes in rapid development, mm -hmm. with so much that we are proud make me make us so proud especially right. during during the COVID-19 during this pandemic um, I would say that's one example that we younger Chinese generation can see how well our, our country handled the situation including from the beginning to now the vaccine and everything um, and we are the witness of how our country dealing with many numerous difficult problems like this so we see the progress and we see I could say that maybe China handled this this situation better than majority of other of the countries in the world so we can see how our country did so that's I think that's a source of why we're proud of country what about Gen Z years I, th I think definitely the prosperity and kind of the protection I have from like my country makes me carry a sense of national pride and responsibility. When I go to the U.S., they'll ask me where you're from. I would, I'm just like so proud to say that I'm from China. And yeah, like you said about the pandemic, because I have online classes with my you know American friends, and they'll be asking me like, oh, can you go out? I'm like, of of course. Like all well, the restaurants are open. I can even go to the cinema. And then they're like only stuck at home and still, you know, dealing with a lot of problems. What about you? I think Chinese people have always been pretty patriotic. There's just that more of them speak English and are present in the world to be heard now. I don't think that we, I don't think Chinese people have gotten more patriotic. And also the way that China's role in the world has also changed. I think when my grandparents were around, China wasn't really that big or that important of a player in sort of global politics or economy. We're still like striving to, to catch up with the rest of the world. And now, you know, even when you turn like a foreign newspaper um, or look at forums, China is always mentioned to some degree in various industries. And so um, I think it's possible that Chinese youths feel more of the need to defend or to clear up misunderstandings, possibly. Uh, in a world where China plays a very big role and everyone's talking about it. 
And when it comes to assuming Chinese younger generations being uh, blindly patriotic, I think that we're the generation that is le least likely to be or brainwashed, right? Because we're tech savvy and many of us speak English and we are exposed to the Western world so much that we are very eager to know more about what's going on in the outside world. Right, and then what's interesting is that the in increased exposure uh, makes us feel that, you know, the, the outside world isn't perfect as portrayed when we were young, as what we used to believe that was the city on the hill. So that's very interesting. And the increased exposure to the outside world, to the broader world, makes us feel that, yes, China is, is good. Maybe there are some flaws, there are something good that we can expect or some progress to expect, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's our country, it deserves us the, the pride, mm -hmm. right? I think it's like uh, our relationship to our country is kind of resembles our relationship to our parents. We realize what are their flaws, what are the limitations, but we still love them because we know um, what, what they're good at and where they are going, where they're improving. So I think it's really based on a really object, at least more objective view than people think we are based on. Mm. What are some of the progress that you witness um, in the country that impress you the most? For me, I have to say the infrastructure. Um, like. Like during the, the pandemic, I think China really responds so fast. And uh, during the, you know, the, the design of the vaccine, we also improve really fast. So I think just um, the, the whole system or the infra infrastructure gives us a lot of sense of security. And that's, uh, that's one thing that I kind of feel the, the most recently. Mm. What about you? For me, I think it's more inclusivity for teenagers' voice to be heard. Um, you know, on Weibo or WeChat, there are more and more, you know, articles from um, Gen Zs or my friends talking about things they believe in or causes they're fighting for. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing I just thought of. Um, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was in the United States during my, uh, like, my college years, and I remember every summer or winter I came back. Um, when I was a freshman, I remember I have to carry my money or my card or things like that. But when I was sophomore, I only need to carry my phone. Whereas when I go back to the United States, I still have to bring my car, my cash, things like that. So I think China is really potentially outgrowing some Western countries on certain perspectives. So yeah, that's one thing I just thought of. Yeah, what about you? I can't think of anything big, um, but I do think for uh, government organs and departments, now they sort of value online interaction more. You see more people who feel like there's an outlet to talk about issues or to raise concerns. Um, like a while ago, they were investigating whether uh, pro environmentally protected lands, uh, government assigned lands, were being used as vineyards. And that's something that was exposed online and addressed, and there was a report that followed. And I think that that's something 10, 15, 20 years back you couldn't imagine in China. I don't even think most government officials would be interested in having an online presence. And I think now they recognize the importance of that and having that as potentially a way they supervise themselves. And looking ahead, what are some of um, the changes that w would you like to see in this country and or more progress in this country than you expect? I think maybe more like freedom in discussion because I think um, you know China has been really open for like teenagers discussions but maybe um, a little bit more respect I think. Mm. What about you? I'd say from my career wise I would say uh, let's continue the discussion of films like Dying to Survive or um, Better Days you know those social topics uh, mm -hmm. I would love to see more movies to be allowed to show or be encouraged to show in, in China so that we can know more about our society. What, what about some of the progress that you've witnessed in the film industry? Tell us more about that. Um, I would say the progress is that like both in movies and TV series, like a few years ago there's a TV series 
based off some governmental, you know, stuff. Um, for example, like how much money they get from, you know, illegal stuff. And that was a huge hit because there weren't any that kind of TV series before that really explores how, you know, this, how the, the dark corners of the system works. But I think the the coming of that kind of TV shows or that kind of artworks um, is an example of how our government is really eager to and brave enough to confront what they use to might you know be blurry about. But now they're confronting that problem. I think that's a huge progress. Do you like watching movies? Do I watch movies sometimes? Do yes. you like? Do I like? I mean, I learned English through watching movies. Mm -hmm. um. What about the domestic films? Do domestic films? Um, I do watch them more because you know when I was in university and things, people, um, my friends, they would all want to watch, and if, you know if you want to fit in, then <laughs> you definitely have to watch it. And I do think that uh, there is more sort of diversity in talking about familial issues, pressure of sending your kids to school. Um, more reflective, not just sort of black and white characters. That was very much the thing uh, in TV series when I was growing up. Um, what about you? Do you like Chinese or Eastern films? Oh, I've been. I watched like I don't, my name is Li Huaying um, <laughs> with my mom. The comedy. Yep, it was. We all cry so much, and I think you know Chinese films focus a lot on the complexity of the figures instead of just like super. Like Marvel or like Avengers, that kind of stuff. And I really love the emotions and the depths from the Chinese films. Um, I think talking about uh, film industry, I think uh, like Eastern countries or or China, we um, have more strengths and advantages uh, to create or produce better films because we have so profound uh, history. And then also, I think we are born to be more emotional than Western people. Do you agree with that? Like we're more sensitive than. Well, I think women are more sensitive than men. <laughs> no, I don't think there's a nationality difference. Oh. Um, yeah, and I think Chinese people are more. Uh, maybe we're sensitive inside, but we are really reluctant to show our yes. uh, our fe feelings to the outside world, and that's something film or art is trying to do is to express yes. what you feel inside. But there's so many um, interesting stories mm -hmm. across the nation, like s through the past decades, thousand years history. There's so yeah, many. Yeah, I definitely stories think uh, China tell. has a great source or sources mm -hmm. of stories yes. that just needs to be put onto the screen. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely one of our strengths. Mm -hmm. what, do you have any like goals, your career goals as a film director? Actually, I'm writing a uh, film right now. It's about uh, mental violence. So it's domestic. Viol uh, the, we talk about domestic violence, and uh, there are a lot of laws and things about that. But mental violence has not been touched that much. Uh, for example, well, if your husband tells you that you are not good enough or you are not doing something good enough, um, women tend to take that as a simple scold or something, an argument. But when that continues to 10 years, 20 years to my mom's or my grandmom's generation, it's up their whole life experience. And that's gonna do some damage that even the woman or the victim, him, him or herself, is not realizing. So that's something I would like to talk about, is about how mental violence is gonna harm people and how people have to, have to be aware of that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are you working on it right now? Yes. <laughs> oh. Yes. When can we watch it? Actually, I'm talking with a couple investors and producers right now. <laughs> Hopefully, we can start shooting next year and mm. uh, show that to the audience. Okay. We're looking forward to the masterpiece. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, and now let's talk about um, the next assumption, which is fewer young Chinese are now marrying. Mm. Well, marriage, that's a huge topic. I am married. Is, you are the only one who's married. I'm the only one who's married. <laughs> How many times Super has that early. happened? <laughs> when you're hosting a table and I am the only one who's married. Hundreds of times. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I do. I think it's quite. It's quite true. Mm, I would say the 
the idea about marriage has changed a great deal. Yes. Because, like, for me or for many of my friends, uh, even as girls, uh, we are not as eager to be married because we don't, like, for me, I don't take getting married as a really important or necessary or essential step or goal of my life. I would say I'm still very romantic about love. If I find someone that I'm comfortable with and we're very in love, we might get married. But if not, I'm fine being single. So that's not giving me any pressure. And fortunately, in my family, my parents are not giving me that pressure either. So it's just the importance of getting married has been lowered. Yeah. yeah. I think it's about the mindset, yes. right? We, marriage is, not, is no longer a must, for, mm -hmm. especially for many girls or, or women. Mm -hmm. um, a man is not a must, is not a need to have. Mm -hmm. It is not a must to have, but it's a good to have. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's a, a change in men's. What about you? I mean, are you, are, are you no. too young to think about that? I personally don't know anyone, like my friends that are married, <laughs> but I've heard their opinions on marriage because there's more dating apps and, you know, the media and shows talking about so our standards have risen. Yeah, we're like hopeless romantics as well. So if we actually find someone, we'll probably marry more easily. What about you? I think the difference when you talk about marriage in China or in Asia, really, and in non-Asian countries, is that child is attached to the idea of marriage. That if you're telling your parents, I'm marrying this guy, but we're not having children, they're like, what, what, what the, the hell? hell? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is so your kid can have a hookah. <laughs> What is the point of you getting married if you're not going to have, you know, one or two babies? And their favorite phrase is, you know, if everyone's like you, then people, humanity will no longer exist. Um, but I think, you know, people of my parents' age, if you look overseas, there are still a lot of people who choose not to have children yes. and then potentially partner up for life or potentially marry. And I think China's going through that phase of redefining marriage and yes. maybe marriage does not have to be attached to having a child together um, or a partnership even if you're single mom now you have a kid and a lot of changes that, that help with pushing uh, the redefinition of that concept and that, I think that's why on the ref on, on, on the superficial end you see you know oh marriage rates have really gone down I don't think it's you know people don't want to partner up anymore but it's just sort of rethinking, do we have to, you know, put something on yeah. the cover? Yes, definitely. I think um, our country is embracing more diversities um, in many aspects, and, and marriage is one of them. We are, there are so many options and possibilities for our younger generations, and we don't have to. Marriage is not a must. And also I think it comes uh, to the a fundamental question of the sense of um, sec security. So um, marriage, th there's a basic assumption that marriage brings um, a sense of sec security. But in fact, maybe it's the opposite. Many people find out that it m might be the opposite. Um, figures show that in Beijing, Shanghai, and many big cities, the divorce rate, the, you know, those 60% of those who chose to marry, like me, <laughs> end up with divorce. So, yeah, marriage may not necessarily bring, bring the sense of I secure. Think, um, the younger generation nowadays just have a more clearer view of what they want, like what they seek for this kind of relationship. Uh, for example, they, 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 like maybe 20 years ago or a couple of decades ago, you know, matchmakers partner two people up and then there you go you are a, you're a, you know a couple but now we take more time take it slower to find a person to you know shape up to each other or something like that so we are more careful about choosing or finding what we want i think yes. that's a good thing and also from the government um level that they are um also embracing the diversity and encouraging people to embrace uh, more diversified lifestyles mm -hmm. and so that that's why we see so many new policies implemented yeah I think which is a um, good thing mm -hmm. yeah. and also um, women are making more money so to speak 
Yes. Like, yeah. it's not just anchors, <laughs> which is brilliant. But also, if you look at grassroots levels, uh, migrant women mm -hmm. that I've spoken to, their parents would be like, you cannot, you know, divorce from your husband because they're an important source of income. You cannot, mm -hmm. you will not be able to afford that child by yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, the women will stay behind to take care of the children, while the men go out to, mm -hmm. you know, Guangzhou or wherever. But now, both the wife and the husband are out there working. And she's saying, well, you know, if I really don't like him and he's gambling or whatever it is, <laughs> I can take care of the child myself because I make money now. Yes. I think that's been a generational change um, yeah. that's sort of significant to know. Yes, I can strongly feel that because many of my friends, um, female friends, they prioritize work or career development um, than marriage or partnership which is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but w do you expect yourself to be married in the near future? Uh, not really. <laughs> I would say that really comes Will your boyfriend watching, <laughs> be watching our show today? Uh, well, uh, well, anyways. Uh, <laughs> that's really about which karma. boyfriend. <laughs> which boyfriend? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, that really depends on karma and a lot of other stuff. I think... Marriage sounds very complex to me. It's about two persons' career, two persons' emotion, two family, two pair of parents, so and and your money and your you know whatever. So that's really really so complex. Like my personal perspective on getting married or getting into a relationship, it is is to make myself and it and the other person comfortable and give emotional to you so that we can grow back together. So that's what for in my relationships. In terms of marriage, I think that needs to take into consideration so much more other elements, which I'm not really into right now. Mm -hmm. so, uh, or we need more time to figure that out. So maybe not in the near future. Challenges. Uh, <laughs> not talk about that. Say, well, my parents in shaman, and you know, for a couple who's there. But if you look at the world that we're at, married a girl, uh, I married a guy from Guangzhou, and they're planning to move to the United States together, and then he got a job in Ireland, and it's all over the place. And especially with COVID, I have friends who have been separated from their spouses for more than a year. And so it's harder for couples to sync up in such a fast changing world and, you know, careers going in different directions and who do I prioritize? Will you grow resentful that I moved because of you? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's harder. I think parents, you know, who are confused as to why we don't all couple up, don't understand the challenges um, that comes with dating and coupling up in the world that we live in now. But it can happen. I'm so hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? <laughs> I mean, um, my mom is really supportive of me. She's supportive of you being married? <laughs> no, 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 no. Being in a strong, independent okay. girl. Okay. So I'm focusing on me first. And I feel like if I'm not the best version of myself, I'm not ready yet, I cannot bring you know, happiness for my other half. So I just feel like it's not fair for you know, either of us. Oh. Talking about pros and cons of marriage, um, I remembered a, <laughs> I remembered um, an interview uh, 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 with an eco economist um, when asked whether staying single or getting married is good for the economy, mm -hmm. and the expert said that the essence of the economy is uh, to maximize the happiness of people and the ut uh, utility of human being, and if everyone um, chooses to. Do Whatever we ways, um, whatever what lifestyle pleases you, then the happiness of the whole society is maximized, yeah. which is good for the economy and good for the society. Yeah. I still think the economist. <laughs> <laughs> With a child, you have a child. You know, mm -hmm. it's the 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 type of money I spend on myself and my habits. I did talk to mom who signed up for karate. I think mm -hmm. for her kid, and she said it's what ten thousand a year. I was like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> She's like, that's the cheapest that you can spend <laughs> on a kid's hobby. So I do think building a family of your own, especially when there's a kid, 
you know, it yields more sort of, you need a house, potentially a good house in a good district, you need diapers, you need, so, you know, I think well, that. I guess it's a, it's a balance, because uh, I think raising a child could also give you a lot of happiness, or a lot of sense of responsibility, a sense of self-realization, sense of, you know, whatever, um, but also you have to spend a lot of energy, a lot of money on that child, so it's about, you know, different person values those balance differently. Um, so I guess just find your balance point, and there yeah. you go. Yeah, that's do what you what pleases you the yeah. most. Yeah. Yes. All right. So from the values that our younger generations uphold to, how are we going to make an impact to the rest of the world? Um, I think for those of you who are watching our show today, um, I hope that you come with a better and more realistic understanding about the young Chinese, which perceptions. Uh, that might be different from what you previously believed. All right, so glad that we had this talk today and thanks so much for watching. And feel free to leave your comment on any social media platform of CGT in China 24. I'm Zhongqing in Beijing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.